Hi, uh, I'm Trishant from Imperial College London. I'm chairing this session, uh, Spotlight 5. The first uh, paper is Learning Reward Functions by Integrating Human Demonstrations and Preferences. Um, Malayandi Palan, uh, Gleb Shevik, Nicholas Charles Landorfi, Doza Sangdig. Uh, Malayandi is, is presenting. Hi, so um, I'm Mene, and I'll be presenting for Andy today. So when we learn from humans, there are many forms of feedback we can use, such as demonstrations, preferences, physical feedback, etc. We typically pick one form of feedback and use data generated in that form to learn from humans. However, today, I'm going to focus on how we can specifically learn reward functions. So we asked the question, can we combine different forms of feedback to learn reward functions better? So in our task, consider a task where the robot needs to move its arm toward a goal while avoiding the obstacle and keeping the arm low. One way we can learn reward functions is to use inverse reinforcement learning. In IRL, we collect demonstrations and from those demonstrations infer a reward function. So above you see Andy giving a demonstration via teleoperation. However, even Andy, who has a lot of experience in this task, struggles to provide a good demonstration. And this is not an isolated issue. When we invited people into our lab to similarly give demonstrations, many of them commented on how difficult it was to do so. So to put simply, it's hard to provide good demonstrations on robots and especially end effectors with um, high degrees of freedom. So if we can't use IRL, what can we use? Preference-based learning is another option. Here, we show a human two trajectories and ask her to pick which of the two she prefers. So for instance, a human may say, OK, since the robot's arm is moving closer to the goal in option one, I'm going to pick that one. Notice how her preference encodes some information about the reward function. Therefore, by repeatedly querying the human, we are able to learn the true reward function. However, note that her response effectively only encodes one bit of information, whether she wants option one or option two. So in practice, preference-based learning is actually really slow and takes many, many queries to learn the true reward function. Our key insight is that demonstrations are rich in information but are relatively inaccurate. On the contrary, preferences are really accurate, but each individual preference query is relatively uninformative. Note how their strengths and weaknesses are complementary. So we ask the question whether we can combine information from both in such a way that amplifies their strengths and demolishes their weaknesses. And we think we can. Here's our idea. First, we collect demonstrations from humans, and then from those demonstrations, learn a distribution about reward functions, a prior, if you will. Now, although our prior may be imperfect, note that this prior effectively shrinks the space of possible reward functions. We can then use preference-based learning to learn a reward function in this much smaller space by repeatedly generating queries, getting feedback from humans, and then updating our distribution. And we repeat this until we converge on the true reward function. Also, since we're using preference-based learning in a much smaller space, we are, there are far less uh, queries required to learn uh, the reward function. To validate our hypothesis, we ran simulations on the driving and manipulation domain. And as we expected, warm starting preference-based learning with demonstrations significantly reduced the number of queries needed to learn the true reward function. To see if this worked in practice, we ran a user study where users trained the robot using both IRL and our method DEMPREF. The robot then optimized over reward functions it learned, and this is what we found. Notice that the DEMPREF robot su is successful at the task, whereas the IRL robot isn't. And this is because the IRL robot overfits uh, to demonstrations from the user that uh, worries about collision avoidance with the obstacle. We also asked users which system they prefer, and they overwhelmingly chose DumpRef. So in conclusion, we showed how we can leverage different forms of feedback in order to better learn reward functions. Thank you. The second presentation is teleoperator imitation with continuous time safety by Bashir al-Qadir, Jacob 
Wally and Vikas Sandman Jacob. How do we transfer knowledge from humans to robots? The field of robotics in recent years has known a real revolution. The capabilities of robots have gone up and the cost of producing new hardware has gone down. One of the challenges, however, is how to give these robots more autonomy and how to get them to accomplish uh, difficult tasks with complex semantics that are hard to program explicitly. Think self-driving cars or robots competing in a video game. <coughs> One way of achieving that is through imitation learning. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bashir Al-Kadir, and today I want to present to you a framework for imitation learning I worked on with my collaborators at Google, uh, Jake Varley and Vikas Sinwani, <coughs> and the name is CVFP, and it's made up of three blocks, contracting, vector field, and polynomial. So the plan for the rest of the talk is to walk you through each one of these three blocks and see how they all come together to form an end-to-end -end pipeline for imitation learning. <coughs> and I'll show you some cool applications at the end. So let's get started. So in imitation learning, a human provides a demonstration for the task of interest. For example, here, uh, walking around a bunch of obstacles. And the demonstration is nothing but a path or a trajectory indexed by time. And now the robots look at this demonstration and extract from it useful information that are necessary for it to replicate the task and in an environment that could be dynamic or changing. In our model, uh, we fit a vector field to the demonstration. So a vector field is simply a, real, uh, a vector valued function that tells you at every point in space where you should move next. And vector fields, unlike trajectories themselves, have the nice property of being additive. And this will prove to be um, this will prove to help uh, to be something that helps us achieve um, obstacle avoidance, for example, in a very elegant way. And I will go back to this at the end of my talk. <coughs> in order to ensure that the learning procedure generalizes to uh, changes in the environment, we impose that our vector field be contracting. Contraction is a generalization enforcing constraint uh, that guarantees a safety that on a safety tube around the demonstration, all trajectories that are close to each other converse to each other. And this can be imposed by a linear matrix inequality involving the Jacobian of F, the vector field. From an optimization point of view, we use some of Square's techniques uh, to cast the learning procedure as a tractable convex optimization problem. Um, so the idea is to parameterize our candidate vector field as a polynomial so that the, the uh, the contraction constraint becomes a polynomial in the negativity constraint. And we replace the negativity by the weaker condition of being sum of squares. And now because of the special structure that our polynomial has, this uh, sum of squares relaxation will turn out to be exact. And now let me show you uh, one application of uh, our framework in the pick and place task, where a human provides the demonstration for this task and then the robot, which here is the KUKA arm with seven degrees of freedom, very much like the one you can see upstairs in, uh, downstairs in this building. Then this robot will look at this demonstration and learn a contracting vector field and then follows it so it can uh, replicate the task autonomously. We also, we also track in real time the location in space of a uh, box-shaped obstacle and we assign to it a repulsive vector field pointing outwards of the obstacle. Now, when we add this vector field to the learned vector field, this will cause the arm to navigate around the obstacle and achieve the task successfully. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. The next talk is conditional neural movement primitives by Mohamed Yunus Sekar, Mert uh, Imer, Justus Pieter, Imer Imre Ugur. Mert is going to give the talk. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mert. Uh, I'm going to present conditional neural movement primitives. Uh, learning from the demonstration has some challenges, like uh, learning from multiple demonstrations, discovering task-related features that are mostly hidden, learning external parameters, and learning in high-dimensional sensor motor spaces and responding to external perturbations. And our aim is to handle all these challenges in one framework. 
CNMP is uh, based on C uh, CMP, which learns the relation between input and output pairs and in encodes it into a vector that can be used in prediction. Training starts as uh, by selecting one of the demonstrations and turning into a uh, sensory motor and time tuple, which, can, which is sent to the uh, parameter sharing encoder network to be uh, turned into a fixed size latent representation, which are then averaged to produce a general representation. And a target point is selected to and concatenated to the represent representation to produce a mean and variance. And the error is backpropagated back back to the network to update the weights. And after the training, the uh, trained neural network is uh, flexible to be conditioned in different uh, situations. And uh, the similar to the training, these points are uh, turned into one general representation. Then a query for all time points is uh, sent to a query network with each uh, general representation of the demonstrations. And then uh, mean and variance produce a movement primitive, which obeys all the uh, conditions that are needed. And the re result is sent to the uh, controller for execution. And uh, here we see CNMP trained with the colored demonstrations to produce black uh, trajectories conditioned on black dots. And it can choose to go up or down from an uh, obstacle by itself. And uh, in this part, the challenge is uh, learning from raw images, which are encoded at CNN and included in the sensory motor space together with time and uh, 2D position. And CNMP can condition itself to arrange the movement, uh, shift the movement between start and end points depending on the time constraints on the conditions parts. Uh, and uh, later we tried the, uh, the performance of CNMP in nonlinear environment to uh, movement relationships. And uh, the heights of the objects are provided as external parameters to the network. And uh, the demonstrations all uh, are shown on the right side. And uh, we uh, trained it with eight trajectories. Here we see the performance of CNMP in, uh, uh, in cases that are inside or outside the demonstration range. And the CNMP can perform well in uh, inside the demonstration range, but external demonstration, uh, external demonstration range, it uh, starts to decrease its performance. And then uh, we try to see, see the, uh, the um, success rate of CNMP in adapting to perturbations and also seeing the uh, conditions that are hidden in the sensory motor space. Uh, starting from the center, it takes the object and it puts it one of four possible endpoints. And this endpoint is conditioned on the uh, shape and the weight of the container. And these information are, are not directly provided to CMMP, but it's encoded in the finger position and the weight uh, for sensor. And here we see an example from the uh, testing test cases. Uh, the right bottom part shows the prediction of CNMP. At first, it covers all four points. Then when it sees the shape of the container, it decreases the box shape. And when it lifts the object, it understands that it's uh, low weight. But then after updating it, it changes its uh, target to the high uh, weight position. So CNMP is uh, flexible and easy to adapt uh, movement primitive generation framework. Uh, we, if, uh, we want to see you at the poster session for further questions and discussions, and thank you. Thank you. So the next uh, paper is from explanation to synthesis, compositional program induction for learning from demonstrations by uh, Michael Burke, uh, Swetrin Valentino Penko, and Subramaniam Ram Ramamurthy. Michael is. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Michael Burke. I'm from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I'm going to be talking about compositional program induction for learning from demonstration, but also which can be used to explain an oracle model or model learned using end to end learning. Um, so we believe that compositional control is key to practical robotics. Um, end to end learning is effective, but the controllers learned this way lack flexibility and interpretability. For example, if you consider an inspection task, it's really difficult for a user to ask, what are you going to do next? And if you want to change the configuration of this task, you can have some challenges. In contrast, compositionality is quite flexible, and it potentially can be interpretable. So we propose a method to infer compositional controllers um, from a, a demonstration sequence and an oracle model 
basically we infer a set of prop switching proportional control laws um, that best explain a sequence. This basically means we infer the gains and the reference points for the controllers. Um, but inference under this model is hard, so we use a set of attribution priors to help um, f help this inference process. So how does this work? Basically, we look at a demonstration sequence and we find the set of controllers that best describe that. Um, we do this in joint angle space, but we use a reprojected um, joint angle space into the image um, using sensitivity analysis of an end-to-end -end model to bias the search. This produces a set of a distribution over controllers, which we can cluster. So here you can see we find five controllers corresponding to the visual, um, co the visual objects being inspected here. Um, we treat this set of controllers that have been inferred as a symbolic um, controller trace. So each controller, because the proportional controller takes you to a state that then is, once that state has been reached, is then you can move to the next state. So this symbolic controller trace sequence can basically be thought of as a string. And because it's basically a string, we can then apply program simplification techniques to actually extract an actual program from this. So what we do is we search for things like loops, um, which are just repeating substrings, or palindromes, which are states that we visit in order and then reverse out of it in order. So this is really nice because this program is very flexible and easily understood by an end user. The problem we have with this program is that the goal states and the reference points of the controllers used by it um, are tied to the fixed ones we inferred in the, um, as part of the original inference process. But we take advantage of the fact that our method is biased towards goal states that correspond to visual objects, and so we just crop the regions around those original inferred goal states um, to produce an augmented data set like this one. And this data set is a set of images and corresponding controller reference points. So we use this, controller, this augmented data set um, to then train a set of new perception networks. And so these perception networks allow you to apply this original program in a very flexible and generalizable way. And what's nice about this is that stepping through this program is just stepping through line by line, calling the appropriate controller, looking at the image, predicting the appropriate reference point. And this is a really trusted perception action control loop. Um, so nice and interpretable. So here you can see that we've just rearranged the objects um, to be done. So. Um, this is also a method of taking an end-to-end -end learning model and turning it into an explainable uh, program. So in summary, um, we explain behaviors using proportional control law sequences. We infer controller parameters and the number of controllers required using sensitivity analysis and sequential Monte Carlo inference. Um, we then use these inferred controllers to produce an actual program, and we visually ground the symbols in that controller. And we believe that a programmatic description is flexible, generalizable, and more interpretable. Thank you. So the last uh, presentation is on harnessing reinforce reinforcement learning for neural motion planning by Tom Jurgensen, Aviv Tama. Uh, Tom is going to be the star. Hi, I'm Tom, and I'm going to present joint work with my advisor, Aviv Tamar. So in the near future, robots are going to encounter scenarios with more dynamic environments. That means that motion planning algorithms must be both accurate and fast, even real time. Although today's algorithms are very accurate, they're still not fast enough. Therefore, our goal is, is to design an accurate algorithm that could also be computed in real time. So to do so, we use the learning setting, where an agent pre leverages previous experience in order to handle new unseen situations. So most previous work in, uh, wo uh, was on imitation learning, where the goal is to take a data set of motion plans and imitate some motion planner. But we observed that performance plateaus with data, and the agent doesn't reach 100% success rate. So we think that we identified the fundamental problem in, in uh, motion planning that should be solved using reinforcement learning methods instead. So that fundamental problem is understanding collisions. Um, which are learned by visiting states near the obstacle boundaries. And we can see here um, an image of uh, states visited during training of imitation learning or motion planner in red and reinforcement learning agents in green. So as we can see, motion planners, they try to avoid collision and stay away from the obstacles. Uh, but reinforcement learning agents try to explore more and gain more information in those critical regions. So 
Now established that reinforcement learning is probably a good direction to take. However, conventional reinforcement learning uh, is not enough. And the reason for that is that in order to gain new information, they use uh, random exploration. So consider this example. We have a robot that's uh, going to try to navigate through a narrow passage to reach the only positive reward on the other side. It's very unlikely that uh, any sequence of random actions during training is going to carry it over collision-free into the other side. So that means the robot won't be able to learn this task uh, successfully. So we propose to combine aspects of the motion plane problem inside the reinforcement learning algorithm in order to handle those kind of narrow passage uh, problems. So we propose DDPG Motion Planner, which is an extension of the DDPG algorithm, but with two modifications. Uh, the first is that we uh, change the uh, actor update into, be, uh, into a model-based actor update. And second is that we provide a new exploration strategy that is uh, based on expert uh, motion plans generated by a motion planner. So for the first feature, we take the old actor update and we decompose it into two uh, new, new components, the uh, reward model and the dynamics model that we, that we know in advance. Uh, and this is shown in green. Um, and we model them using smooth functions in order to be compatible with backprop. So the second feature is the smart exploration strategy. And we can see it with, with this image. So consider a failed trajectory during training. Uh, the, the agent collides with an obstacle. So in order to avoid similar situations in, in test time in the future, we provide the replay buffer with a uh, successful uh, motion plan uh, generated by a motion planner. So these two modifications allow us to reach a near perfect success rate, uh, shown in this example. So here we see a robot trying to navigate from the green sphere all the way to the blue sphere while avoiding collisions. So on the left, we see the previous method, DDPG and hindsight experience replay, which is designed to handle sparse reward. But they re only reach around 30% success rate and specifically has really hard time with the neural passage. While our method um, reaches 97% success rate and we handle the neural passage very well, as we can see here. So we also generalized to new unseen obstacle configuration, basically by conditioning the prediction on an image of the uh, obstacles. Yeah, and finally, we also show that our motion planner is faster than the motion planner that we used for training, uh, six times uh, faster, actually. So taking all of these parts together, we have an accurate algor algorithm that is also uh, faster. Thank you for listening. Can I ask all the speakers to come on stage? Questions? So my question is for Khatir on learning based on SOS technique. So in your work, uh, Walking and manipulation scenario, are you learning the trajectories in the joint space or in XYZ space? And if it is in the joint space, what are the complexity and computation time for your SOS optimization? Thank you. Thank you, that's a very good question. So actually, uh, we can do learning in both spaces, joint space and Cartesian space, and each one of these two spaces has its advantages and drawbacks. So in Cartesian space, it's very straightforward, for example, to do obstacle avoidance because obstacles are known in Cartesian space. Uh, in joint space, it's easier to control the arm because it's more natural, it has seven joints. Uh, from, to answer your question about computational complexity, well, there are more, jo more joints than uh, degrees of freedom in a Cartesian space, so of course the complexity grows. Uh, but if, uh, you know, uh, theoretically speaking, solving the semi-definite program uh, we formulate is, uh, takes polynomial time, right? Uh, I hope that answers, uh, answers your question. Um, so my question is for the synthesis to, uh, or rather the, uh, the execution to synthesis group. Um, you were able to learn constraints or sub-programs which were of the nature of reach a particular joint configuration. Um, have you tried experiments with avoid certain configurations and were, would you be able to learn that through this method? Um, yeah, so that's actually something we're currently extending to. Right now the inference can't actually do that. Um, well. It can avoid it, but it means the, when we're doing sensitivity analysis to our model, 
Um, basically what happens, we get a lot of unused particles in the inference space. That, so it still infers that you should go around something. Um, we'll find goals along there, but you're wasting the samples along the way as part of that inference. Um, yeah, but okay. actually the sensitivity analysis can be ad adjusted so that we can build that into the model as well. Uh, so my question is for the last presentation. Uh, so your approach has seems to have a little bit of flavor of dagger, which is very common in imitation learning. So can you comment a little bit on the your similarity and the difference uh, to that? And then have you ever tried to compare with dagger or is that uh, or you've already done so? Yeah, so actually we started off with imitation learning, which is the first part of the talk, and we also considered dagger. But the problem with dagger is that uh, by the formulation, the, you need to uh, run Dagger, run the, the motion planner for every, failed, um, for every failed point. But that basically means that this is very uh, computationally expensive. Uh, so our method instead uh, doesn't learn basically from imitation learning because we formulate the experience into the re experience replay. So it's a different approach of using sort of like the same uh, information, but compare it also with the exploration that we gain from reinforcement learning. Okay, does that, yeah? So uh, my question is for the uh, Kashir. Uh, so uh, when you have uh, vector fields with uh, obstacles, the vector fields will not be contracted around the obstacles. So I don't know. That's correct. You, yeah, so so how did you handle that? I didn't get a sense. That, that's a very good question. So we start with a vector field that is contracting, and then we modulate it, and we could end up with something that is not contracting. So the whole idea is that our modulation has to be local. The size of the obstacles could not be too large so that we don't deviate too much from the original vector field. And as long as we stay within the original uh, region of contraction, uh, we, should be, uh, we should be all right. But that's a good question, because uh, doing obstacle avoidance, in it's a hard problem in general. And the, uh, the method we're uh, proposing here is local in nature, so we cannot expect it to, uh, to work in full generality. Yeah, but it's a good question. Thank you. Hi, right, this is a bit of a follow-up question. So if you're going to make essentially like a potential field, but you're also doing this with sums of squares programming, you have to scale the whole problem correctly. Right, so how do you how do you choose how pointy essentially to make your your <coughs> obstacles? Like, how do you know that they're not going to be too big? Like you said. Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat the last part of your question? I'm not sure I heard it. If you're if you're going to add obstacles as potential fields, yeah, and then also have to solve a, a, an SDP. Oh right, okay, okay, I get yeah. you. Okay. How how do you pick how pointy they are <laughs> essentially? Yeah, exactly. How big they are. Yeah, again, that's, uh, that's a really good question. So we're adding two vector fields that could possibly have different units, so we have to choose scaling. I will even go one step further and say, we don't necessarily have to add the two vector fields. There are other more complicated ways uh, to do that. Uh, there are different methods of doing this, so it's really more of an art than a science, and it really depends on the application. And here it's like more of a trial and error. So the, the good thing about just adding things times a scalar is that you can try different scalars and calibrate to the problem, but in general, it's a good question I don't have. Uh, I don't have a complete answer to that right now. <coughs> so I have a question for the last presentation. Um, can you generalize for uh, dynamic obstacles? Can you generalize this approach? Yeah, so that's a great question. So that's the goal of our research, to have dynamic obstacles. And we think that if we'll have a vision-based system that's really accurate, and also we could plan in real time, we'll be able to do so. Uh, the only uh, the only uh, drawback will be if like, the obstacle is moving back and forth and the robot will also do the same. But our goal is to go to a really fast prediction based on vision, and we have um, work that we are now working on to um, make uh, extend this work basically into an even faster algorithm that we show here. So thank you.
Uh, hi, this, this question is also for the last speaker. Uh, I wonder for your uh, expert guided explorations, uh, where is the better exploration come from? Is it from a, a, a pre-computed algorithms or some human uh, guidance? Does uh, you have a human involved in the loop all the time? Okay, so the goal was to make it automated. So we have just an off-the-shelf motion planner, sample-based motion planner that we didn't do any optimization to. And the only reward is to, um, once the agent fails and collides with an obstacle in the narrow passage uh, problem, you need to provide it with some sort of reward, even if it's not the best reward, if it's, if it, even if it's not optimal, and make sure that the reinforcement, algor reinforcement learning algorithm take, uh, takes care of the optimality later. But it will need some sort of like a good signal to, to guide it. So this is a basic uh, motion plan. Uh, we didn't do anything to, to make it uh, converge faster or anything like that. So ba basic, by basic you mean uh, RRT or? Yeah, I think it was uh, RRT. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have to we have to close this. Um, let's thank all the all the speakers. Uh, thank you.